And so you can see what his skateboard is. It's him with a bottle of booze and a cigarette. <laughs> He's proud of it, you know. <laughs> he probably tells that story. I got knocked. I got you know knocked out twice uh, by Heath Ledger with a surfboard, right? Like I don't know if he remembers it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of, say it with me, the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Let's jump into this, what do you say? Look, this is probably in the top five podcasts we've done. I got to say, this was an amazing episode. My guest is Catherine Hardwick, okay? That name may or may not sound familiar, but uh, this woman is incredible. And what an energy, too. Okay, she's a director. She was also a uh, production designer before that as well um, on very famous films and w- working with phenomenal uh, directors and teams and crews on amazing films that you have heard of. Okay, so um, production designer. She worked with Cameron Crowe, Richard Linklater, David O. Russell. So she worked on, look, Tombstone. I'll be your Huckleberry. Are you kidding me? Tank Girl. That's a good one. Two Days in the Valley, The Newton Boys, Three Kings. I love Three Kings. And she also worked with Cameron Crowe uh, and actor-producer Tom Cruise on Vanilla Sky as the production designer. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Look, uh, Tombstone and like Three Kings are, uh, you know, some of my favorite. Those are, those are like two of my favorite movies for real. Um, and we talked a little bit about that. I, I brought up three Kings for sure. Um, I, mean, I just love that movie so much. Such a great, such a great film. I mean, this woman, she's just had the most incredible career and then she's done all this. And then what does she do? Yeah. She directs one of the biggest young adult, you know, films that started this whole, you know, movement. Okay. Global movement. She directed Twilight. That's right, the original Twilight um, with Robert Pattinson, Kristen Stewart. Okay, uh, you know Twilight. You know, I mean the 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 crazy development that that movie had as far as like what it created. It's insane. And we talked about why she didn't go to direct the next one, right? And watch it become this billion dollar global phenomenon and it's so interesting how she talked about the first one being like an independent film they didn't know what was going to come out like they had to cut the budget finding those actors so she you know she discovered not discovered but you know brought them into their roles robert pattinson and kristen stewart and you know famously uh catapulted them into superstardom now they had already done great stuff beforehand obviously but this really you know catapulted them into stardom um so she talked about how she cast them and um wonderful stories you know to be honest with you and then look she also talked about um you know, working, look, she directed Lords of Dogtown, okay? So we talked about that a lot, actually. She lives in Dogtown. So we talked, she directed Heath Ledger, you know? Oof, and Emil Hirsch that's in the movie. And we, she talked about, you know, working with Heath Ledger and directing him and what that was like. And, you know, right after that, he went and did The Dark Knight. So she kind of talks about that a little bit in that transition. And look, it's just... This was just such a phenomenal interview. She told just such the most amazing stories and how she got into film and directing because her first film was called 13. It's like there's just so much to talk about with this woman. I absolutely want to have her back on to discuss more things because there's just so much I didn't get a chance to talk to her about. 
Like, are you kidding? We're working with Tom Cruise and Vanilla Sky and uh, Cameron Diaz and just, you know, working with Cameron Crowe. Um, all these directors, I, just her own stuff too. Look, and she's got this Quibi series coming out. Look, I, I got to cut this intro short because we just got to get to the episode. It's just so amazing. Um, so yeah, just kick back, enjoy. This is just such a, you know, beautiful episode and um yeah just really really enjoy it so look just you're gonna you're gonna love this okay so kick back um katherine hardwick beautiful episode uh but before we get to that we're gonna have a word from our sponsor and then uh we'll be back okay just a second all right word from our sponsor all right texas real food as always of course um okay so look before we get to the interview real quick don't forget, check us out on social media, okay? So uh, Lone Star Plate TX, you know, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and check out our YouTube channel, The Lone Star Plate. Subscribe, like a video, share it. That's what you could do, share it. And uh, of course, like and follow us on all the other uh, podcast platforms. We're everywhere. So uh, thank you as always for supporting us. And, um, you know, we keep trying to put out great content. So thank you to the great team behind us here. Uh, everyone here uh, that makes this happen. Just an amazing crew of people. So uh, thank you so much for supporting all of us. And uh, as always, more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. All right, let's get to the episode, okay? Catherine Hardwick, oh, this amazing woman. All right. Oh, real quick. She stood up the whole time. Okay. So if you're listening, you don't get this, but if you watch it on YouTube, you'll see, but she stood up the whole interview, just so much energy, this woman. So think about that. I never done that before. I don't, I've never done that. So that was awesome. She was just an amazing woman. I got to tell you this. So kick back, great stories. Enjoy Catherine Hardwood. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Great. How are you? Excellent. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Or, noon or whatever. Yeah. It's it's <laughs> noon, right? I don't know. What do you say at noon? I don't know. I guess it depends what time you get up, right? Like. <laughs> hey. Cool. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Everything sound okay? Am I am I sounding okay? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. I love the background up there, right above you, uh, on the wall there. Yeah. That's so awesome. Got my skateboards and everything. Uh, I just watched that movie this morning, Lords of Dogtown. I mean, oh, yeah. I, mean I, I hadn't seen it in a while, but when it came out, I watched it a gazillion times. I'm not going to lie. I loved it when it came I really did. I remember having the DVD like I was, you know, so I was like, oh, OK, let me revisit. And yeah, memories. Honestly, it took me back to a good time in my life, too, uh, during that time. So oh, thank yeah. you. That so movie, thank you. I've got the poster there, but that movie was like the most, oh. I don't know if you can see, the most yeah, fun. Yeah to do i love to do. <laughs> oh, i can't imagine uh you worked with the great heath ledger right like that's amazing and watching the movie again today it made me realize oh i miss that guy so much i miss seeing him in movies i really do i hear you i mean that was an incredible experience working with him and watching his creative process he's he was just kind of like so free flowing, you know, and he would just have all these kind of neat ideas and just like roll camera. And then you didn't always know what he was going to do. <laughs> I did not know what he was going to do. I'm like, OK, dude, surprise me. And it would be so cool. Like when he was supposed to in the skateboard shop, you know, I mean, in the party, you know, when he's wearing that suit, which there's yeah. a great story with that suit that suit really belonged to the real skip emblem who he was no playing. way no in way the 70s skip was that skinny i went over to his house he had this elk skin blue suit with the rhinestones and then the <laughs> buttons and everything I'm like oh my god what if he could fit into it he puts it on he fits into it perfectly oh. <laughs> And then he just walked to that party in that crazy ass suit, you know, uh, this famous guy named Nudie made that suit for Skip. Nudie was N-U-D-I-E. He made stuff for Elvis and Vegas. I mean, he was a legend. Wow. And he wow. made that crazy ass suit. And then, uh, then he, all the time in that party, I never knew what he was going to do. Like he had the, he had a surfboard and he like, grabbed it and then he whacked you know the other uh skater the one that uh 
No, I did, and the the one that played uh, oh my god, I just forgot the guy's name that played the uh, Asian skater. Uh, oh dear, how did I forget his name? Uh, <laughs> whacked him, and then he fell over, and like I'm like oh my god, is, are you okay? And the kid was so the, the scactor was so stoned that he didn't even notice he got. <laughs> Oh my God. And then I said, well, just stay out of his way. Give him space so he can do whatever he wants with that surfboard. And then take two. Bam! He hits him again. And I'm like, this is insane, dude. So I took him out of the scene, the other kid out of the scene. And then also in that sequence, he ends up on the roof. But we yes. didn't we climb up on the parapet and be. I was going to ask you about that. I was, I wrote that down. I was like, is that what's going on up there? Right? Like, okay. Oh. That was not planned out. We didn't have a stunt person up there, a spotter, a pad, nothing. Oh my you know, God. Uh, I have a picture of me and the stunt coordinator that we were just staring like, what the hell is he doing? You know, <laughs> but he did fall off. Thank God. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. I was wondering that I'm thinking, did they green screen something out below that we don't see or something? Because oh. he's, you know what I mean? I thought, and then by the end of it, his shirts, right. is ripped off. He's his one arm, one leg, just dangling off the side of the building. Like, believe me, I was having a melt. I was like, <laughs> dear God, do not fall. <laughs> Oh man, but that's what probably why you wanted him for the role, right? You he sort of embodied that time period, that film, everything. That it was and yeah, that just, spirit. Like, you could see he just flowed right into that character, his oh, body language. God. Yeah. Was, you know, and of course he had the fake teeth in because he up front, had, right? Yeah, yeah. And Skip had those different teeth and he thought that would really help him find the character. But, you know, the thing that blew, blows my mind is after he did that character, which you see, he's all skater, surfer. Yeah. Stuff, totally. Six days later, he is shooting Brokeback Mountain six days after he rapped with us. And I'm oh like, my how God. the hell did he completely change his body, completely change his voice? And you felt like in Brokeback, he'd been sitting up there on that horse for his whole life. Like, yeah actors you would think would take six months to prepare for that he had gone up there and spent a little time writing before dogtown then he came back did all of dogtown and then went back up but he's just like incredible like how he embodied like the physicality the voice and it totally changed like between those two movies was six days in between <laughs> wow that that is an incredible turnaround right that is that's insane that's uh, it, that's like travel time right i mean that's no time to even you're right it that movie is like god that's insane and that's what i mean right like yeah, gosh it's oh wow and, and you're right like every time i do like a little class i have these little classes i do you know for uh, film students or film festivals or whatever and i show one really cool clip at least one with Heath in it every time. And of course the whole audience and myself are just always like, Oh yep. my God. Well, yes. it's the scene, the scene I almost always show is where he's shaping the surfboard at the end. Yes. The Maggie now. May, Maggie yes. May. Yep. Yes. Oh my God. Great scene. The way yes. he sits down on the stool, right. And he just sort of, and then it picks back up and you see him singing the lyric. He's just such a phenomenal He's just such a phenomenal actor. He really just, gosh, he really did embody that whole spirit. I'm still like reeling from watching it, right? Like I'm still bubbling. My, my blood's still like bubbling from the whole experience of it. And I know what scene you're talking about with the surfboard too, because the way, if, if I think it's the same way, he grabs it and he whips it around and you just see like, oh my God. And he just goes outside, right? You didn't know which way he was. Yeah. 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 Insane. <laughs> At the Thanks. party, like he was out of control, which his character was supposed sure. to, be, you sure. know, but for myself behind the camera, I'm like, holy, oh, Shogo. He, he slapped Shogo with that. Okay. That I don't know if we use that take or not, uh, but he just smacked right into the guy. And the guy was just like, nothing even happened. He was so <laughs> stoned. 
He didn't even notice it. I go, I go, dude, you got to be careful. Get out. Of here. <laughs> what are you talking about, man? Nothing happened. I'm like, dude, it's on camera. Slam. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this kid, this kid sounds hilarious. That sounds so funny. I love it. What a great place to be. You don't even know if you got hit with a surfboard. I know yeah. okay. that skateboard, the second one. That's yeah. And so you can see what his skateboard is. It's him with a bottle of booze and a cigarette. <laughs> He's proud of it. You know, <laughs> so- he probably tells that story. I got knocked. I got, you know, knocked out twice. Uh, by Heath Ledger with a surfboard, right? Like I don't know if he remembers it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I finally said, okay, you're out of this scene. I had to kick him out of the scene because sure. I thought I was going to have to send him to the hospital or something. You know, <laughs> take three. <laughs> I think the one y'all used, I mean, I don't really know, but the one I just watched, no one gets hit, but honestly, he comes close to hitting 15 people. Yeah, like he just I, like skims everybody's hair. It's like unbelievable. They didn't all get hit. And you see everybody like run and come back to be like, what's he doing now? Like, God, it, it, yeah, I, it's amazing. Uh, you know, as a fan of watching movies like that's that's what you want to see. You want to see you don't know what's going to happen with that character either. At least if that's what it calls for, you know, uh, yeah, uh, it's yeah. great. He was so creative, you know, just so free flowing, funny, you know, I love well, how does he prepare for the you mentioned that, like how he prepares for the roles like what? Because famously, um, how he prepared for, let's say, um, the Dark Knight uh, playing the Joker. Right. There was all this mystique and, and myths about what he was doing and where he was. And, um, you know, is he totally in character the whole time? Are you able to talk to him like in between? Oh, well, he was pretty much in character, but um, the thing is he, right when he got the job, he immediately had a a freak out, like maybe I shouldn't do this. And apparently he did that on a lot of his shows. Like I made a mistake committing to this, I could never (laughs) pull it off. You think I can't pull it off. And he like calls up the producer and says, I'm not doing it, you know, but the producer didn't even tell me that actually they just they just kind of talked him down off the ledge and then he showed up for a rehearsal and goes man I'm sorry I tried to drop out I go I didn't even know anything (laughs) but maybe that's why they call him ledger yeah that's why his name right oh but uh the thing is I know one thing he did is when he got the job he said he went down to Costa Rica and did spend like a week surfing and skateboarding just to like get that mentality back because of course sure. he grew up in Australia and surfing but just yeah. to get back into the groove and then uh you know then we had the rehearsals here at my house you know it was really fun because I live in Dogtown like so oh and, really oh, oh this is oh wow you know we right across the street from where we're standing right now is the apartment where Tony Alva lived in 1975. You no can way. The window. And so this, like Tony was our skateboard coach for all the boys, right? And so Tony would come over here and he'd say, yeah, I lived right there. I used to be able to look into your house. And then the part where the sidewalk is up, you know, like tilted up from the roots of a tree. That's where I did this trick. And, you know, so- oh God. Very so Heath came over to the house and we would rehearse here, you know, in the middle of Dogtown. Yeah, that's super cool. <laughs> I mean, talk about getting into the role, right? Like that's amazing. Wow, that's yeah. I didn't I mean that that makes that all the more special of uh that film and and everything behind it. Um, you know, I'm curious how you got into something like that, or were, were you I mean, I know that's where you live, right? But so you knew the whole history. How, did you skate yourself growing up? Was that something anything you did? Not really, not Mechel. <laughs> that wasn't a thing <laughs> <I've been. laughs> but I wish it had. But um, but the thing is, I had when I first moved from Texas to LA, I just I I wanted to be a director, but I also just thought, oh, if you're a director, you should know how to act so you can direct actors. So I took an acting class, and Stacy Peralta was in the acting class. He wow. was kind of doing the same thing that I was doing. He wanted to direct wow. too. And so day one, you know, the acting teacher tells you, you're going to do your monologue and you're supposed to bring an activity that you do like 
baking a cake while you're doing your monologue. And I, I don't know what I brought, but I suddenly see this guy up there and he's got a skateboard and he's putting stickers on it. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> That's your activity. I went up and talked to him after class. He goes, yeah, I forgot my activity. So I just went out in the trunk and I had a skateboard and a bunch of stickers. And so <laughs> Stacy and I got to be friends from the word go. And then somehow I got to work on that movie. I was a production designer on Thrashing, which was Josh Brolin. Yes, crazy. I've seen that. Trust me. Oh, man. Oh, my God. It's a ridiculous, <laughs> <that> hilarious <laughs> movie, you know. So I was the production designer on that with Antonio, yeah. Abbott, you know, Stacy. All the skaters were on that. It was hysterical. You know, my whole budget for the art department was $5,000. And, you know, I had to get all the skateboards for free. I had to, you know, like my assistant was at the back of the truck selling skateboards, selling weed, you know, it was just hilarious, you know, <laughs> but I had fun because I love that skater energy. Like all the kids, you know, sure. the skaters would be jumping in the art truck and then you'd stop to get gas and then one of them did be doing an acid drop off the gas station. The other be skating up the gas tanks. I'm like, yes, I love this. That's and so then, awesome. So I knew Stacy and Tony for a long time. And then Stacy's uh, partner, Stephanie, was working at Fox Searchlight. Okay. And Fox Searchlight picked up 13 at Sundance. Yeah. And Stacy saw an early copy of 13 with Stephanie and he thought, oh my God, that's Catherine. I know her. Da, da, da. And he liked how raw it was and how gritty and edgy. And he, he recommended me to Sony to direct the movie. And so, and David Fincher was going to first direct it for $75 million. He wanted wow. to like 70 or $80 million. And the studio was like, hell no, we're not paying that skateboard movie it's going to be like 15 million so when i came in you know i had the the scrappier low budge attitude sure indie <laughs> indie attitude right yeah yes and then and then stacy uh you know stacy backed me and then i'm like i live and i to i surf you know i surf more than i surf. and so i went in and pitched it and they were like okay let's try it and then i went and hung out with jay in hawaii almost got arrested like three times uh you know from the first moment i landed there i i landed there because i go hey jay i'm doing the movie and i want to really research and get to know you so i can you know do the rewrite with more of you in it and he goes okay uh, you can come out and visit me will you be staying in a hotel i go yeah he goes will you be taking me to dinner and stuff will you have a rental car i go yeah, he goes, okay, then go ahead and come. And I'm <laughs> what does this mean? You know, like, what am I He's in? plotting. He's already plotting, right? Like, I already yeah. Had a plan. Like, what hotel are you staying in Turtle Bay? He <laughs> said, I like their towels. Okay. Now, that, <laughs> that's an obvious red flag, you know. And <laughs> yes, day, well, day one, I pick him up in the rental car and he goes, okay, turn here, turn here, turn here. Okay, stop, turn off the car. And now uh, I'm gonna climb over the fence, get these mangoes, cause they're three bucks in the market. Get all these mangoes, they're ripe. I've been watching the tree and then you, I'm gonna hand them to you and then you get in the car, then we take off. I'm like, you mean you don't know this person? No, well, is he home? I mean, I see a car in the drive. Don't worry about it, you know? So we're like, Stealing mangoes, hauling ass from the owner. I'm like, you know, the first five minutes I meet him, then we go to, then let's go to the hotel. So we go to Turtle Bay and I notice he has a huge duffel bag that's empty. As we're walking down the hall, he sees the maid's cart, you know, a cart that the maid was out in the thing. And yeah. as, soon as he walks past it, unzips the duffel bag like five towels, six towels, <laughs> seven towels go in it, zips it up. He's like, yeah, keeps walking down the hall. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> and so, wow. of oh, course, man. that's in the first half day. Of course, I'm just loving it, taking notes and, like, trying to put all the crazy shit that Jay Adams did into the movie, you know. So, <laughs> oh my we, goodness. And we did get uh, Jay RIP. We got him. Um, uh, I wrote a letter to his parole officer because he was on parole in Hawaii. 
we're making a movie about him. He's got to come over. I want him to be in it. So they let him come over for a couple of days and he's in the movie, you know, of course wow. he smuggles a fake hand grenade back and gets arrested again. You're like, what is, oh, oh like, man. You, know? <laughs> you just can't stop. Right. Like he's himself. He just, yeah. He just never grew up and, you know, but anyway, all of that was really good for me because I could put all those things into the movie. So it was sure. really good research. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's correct. What, who, where is he in the movie? Where, which part? Or Well, okay. You have a, a party at Jay Adams mom's house, uh, yes. Rebecca De Mornay's house, kind of yep. like a goofy party. And so he's in there in one of his shirts, you know, his, okay. His, yeah. Pendleton right on. Shirt is hanging no. there you know i think Tony, <laughs> tony's in there too yeah that's yeah. awesome that's i love when that when that happens in a movie right you get the real people and they're just sort of somewhere uh, in the movie or play some role, you know, someone in the movie that, that i didn't realize was in the movie till i watched it today mitch hedberg <gasps> yes mitch hedberg yes he's so i great. was like what mitch hedberg i i told i mean it took me a second actually till he turned his head and said something about the wheel to the guy i was like that's yeah. mitch oh my gosh so oh man talk about another guy i absolutely miss he's like he's one of he's it could be my favorite comedian or if not top three for sure miss yeah. that guy so I much that's one thing that's pretty sad is there's quite a lot of people in that movie that are not with us anymore. Yeah. And wow. A lot, a lot of actors and one per you know, it's, wow. un it's unbelievable, you know, wow. but all those people had a heart lived heart, you know, they, yeah. they, they lived to the fullest and sure. you know, now they're, <laughs> they're, they're up there somewhere else. <laughs> skateboarding right. and doing something fun. I hope, you know, riding the big wave. Absolutely. Of course. Yeah. Uh, a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, it is. It's a phenomenal film, uh, uh, Catherine. It really is. Uh, you know, it just what strikes me about it today, I was thinking it, it almost feels like those kids made that movie. Yeah. The way it's kind of <laughs> shot and everything. That's how I feel. It's like, cool. It's like one of their friends had a camera and just was documenting what was happening in the moment. It's such a visceral, I just love it so much. It's just such a oh, good film. That's so cool. Yeah. Cause of course I was worried at the beginning, like, okay. Um, you know, the documentary is so great that how could you ever make a the movie? Z boys, right? Is that what you're talking about? It's so good. And yeah. but then that is a bunch of guys in their forties and fifties talking about what they did. So I'm like, yep. well, I want to be with them when they did it, you know? And that's what we got to do is just like ride along with them climb over the fence, get totally. in the pool, you know, let's yeah. drain this pool, you know, all that. <laughs> stuff. That was so fun. I mean, I couldn't have had, we couldn't have had more fun. And of course, Tony Alva was our consultant the whole time. I mean, he was oh, great. Me almost every single day and he would, he trained the boys and he's very hard on them, especially on the kid that's playing him on Victor. Yeah. Oh. He's like, oh, man, make me look bad. And that kid, that kid didn't even, <laughs> That kid didn't even know how to skate. He was from the really. Bronx. He is from the Bronx, so oh. Tony trained him how to skate and all this, and he was hard on him, man, dude. Wow, you know? wow. So that was that was pretty interesting. Uh, but Tony would like, okay, I'd say which swimming pool because you know the pools were shaped like amoebas and stuff. They yeah. all had the round edges, and nowadays that's not the fashion for pools. They're just rectangular that's yeah. completely out of style so we had to get like helicopter shots and google earth where the heck are those oh, wow and then he would go over to the house tony and he put on his goggles and he'd look down and see if the transitions were right and if he thought it was going to work then he'd say okay drain the pool you know <laughs> I love it. So just like in the movie when the kids are like have the binoculars and you see them looking, you guys basically did that. Like that's like real. That's yes. Like, oh yeah. That's how we found those what yeah. people were still around, you know. I love that. that didn't change. Yeah. I could see him I love that image of him like sticking his face like the goggles into the pool, like, yep, this will work. Drain it, right? Just drain that's it. Drain it. Exactly. Drain it. God, that's what an amazing God. These are such amazing stories. This is this is just so unbelievable. And I can imagine all of it just feels like the whole movie feels like 
unexpected. Like a lot of the stuff is unexpected or you didn't know it was going to happen. You know what I mean? I just feels like a mix. Obviously it's, it's a film. I mean, you, you have a plan, but yeah, it, it's just such a great film. Oh, such a good film. Such, such a good movie. Yeah. I, I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, you know, another thing I was looking at um, this new, um, the show that came out, um, don't look back. Don't, no, look don't, don't look back. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. Don't look deeper. Why did I say that? Don't look back. I just, that's a documentary I just watched actually. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. It, it, but it was on uh, Quibi, right? It was on Quibi and I, I don't know how to watch it anymore. Well, I guess what? It's coming out on Roku. So Roku bought all of Quibi and they, we just had a meeting with them. They said, oh yeah, we're going to do a big launch in the next few months and then you'll be able to see it because it's oh. really, really the fun. trailer was also i was like okay i i gotta watch you know i like to binge stuff i'm not gonna lie i was like i cannot wait to just like get into this and i was like oh my god i can't figure it out plus i'm not very smart technologically so i was like this maybe there was a way but i couldn't figure it out well, okay I i'm glad you told me about that i don't think there's a way you can see it right now but it will okay. be i think in the next three or four months and right. i love that show i mean don Cheadle. oh my god <sighs> I saw that. Oh my God. Yeah. I'm a major fan. Yes. Yes. Emily Mortimer has a really interesting character. And then she's amazing. Helena Howard is amazing. You know, she's just got this incredible face and, and uh, you know, she really commits a hundred million percent to her role. What's the show uh, sort of about just for our, our listeners here? Like basically. Oh yeah. Okay. So don't look deeper. It's set 15 minutes in the future quote 15 minutes in the future so there's already ai in the schools so you basically have like ai sort of semi life looking life like robots that will help you like if you are sort of a loner you know the robots will come up and hang out and talk to you or help you wow. with your homework and stuff <laughs> so there's a whole situation where you know our lead character finds out something about herself that she did not know. And that's, you know, that's the whole thing. And then this discovery. So she's, it's a coming of age story, but in a, with a whole nother level, a whole yeah. nother twist, you know? Wow. Yeah. Wow. So it's fun. It's really cool. Yeah. What, what, what was it that drew you to that? Was it the AI aspect uh uh, this idea of 15 minutes in the future, that sounds very intriguing. I, I just, I've never heard that, right? It's always, you yeah. never see that. That's intriguing. It's very close to like what could be happening and yeah. what is happening right now. It's like just around the corner, right? Yeah. Like it could be just around the corner. Yes. Yeah, that's and cool. Or even it could be happening right now. And, you know, there are like AI robots that, you know, help people and, you know, take care in hospitals and that's carry That's true. There is, in, you know, um, and there's some big stars that are AI that don't even exist. But in China, they have huge followings and they sing songs and everything. So oh, really? Oh, yeah. There's a uh, bunch of uh, superstars that you can write a song in China and you can send it in. If it gets chosen, these AI characters will sing your song and then they do concerts. I mean, it's a huge deal. What? And I never heard of this. One of them just got signed to CAA, my same agency. <laughs> what an A? What? This is cr that's crazy. What? I've been on this earth 41 years. How did this happen? This is. <laughs> oh, dude, you look it up. You're going to see all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah. That's They're like crazy. Pop stars. Yeah, it's wild. Uh, oh, oh, no, it's fun. You know, so anyway, I, I like that idea of like it's a it's a coming of age story still which of course i love you know yeah. from 13 and all that 13. like the volatile time in your life so many you discover so many things who am i as a person and so and i like the idea of doing something slightly in the future because then i could get all my stuff that i learned back at ut austin solar energy i used to be an architect and uh, study architecture at ut and we were way ahead of our time doing radical solar energy stuff and everything. Um, I wish the world had <laughs> caught up. We still haven't caught up to our dreams, but um, 
So that's what I put like, you know, solar balloons in the shots and like in the school. And I just kind of snuck a lot of cool things into the. Oh, wow. That yeah. is cool. Yeah. Wow. So that's I give away too much of the plot twist, but it's, sure. it's really like a mind bender. It's really that's, fun. Oh man. That's, that's amazing. Um, yeah. And, and the way the, this particular series is set up, right. They, they're not standard like episode links, right? Like, so it's a different way to tell the story, right? Essentially. Uh, they're basically no longer than 10 minutes each episode. So yeah. it adds up to like a feature film adds up to about two hours, but you get it in these chapters, you know, so you can, you know, you'll be able to binge it. And each chapter kind of starts with sometimes like a flashback, sometimes a weird twist, you know, so each chapter starts more like books, you know, or, things that start in an interesting way. So I see. Oh, so that's weird. cool. It's not yeah. so here. It's really fun. And, you know, I had a great time doing it because just thinking in those short bites, I mean, how can I tell really efficiently tell a story? How much interesting information can I pack into one frame? And wow. then there was one more mind blowing thing. You won't see this on Rock, Roku, but you know we had to be able to make it vertical, work on a phone, or horizontal. So I had to compose shots that could work either way. <laughs> oh my god! How does that even? Oh my god! Did you have like two iPhones? Just like like okay, is this framed rally? Like, how do you even do that? Did you have like a square on the mon like the well, I like the uh, like? How do they do that? You know. I didn't really want to put all that on, uh, do that on the monitor. And I, I did some tests and then I finally decided to go ahead and shoot it with the nice vertical format. And I tested what would work and not work when you translate it to, to a nice horizontal format, which would be called uh, hamburger versus hot dog format. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Then later on, I translated it, you know, reframed it, but I had it always, you know, in the back of my mind that I was going to make sure that I could do that. But it was, that's, that's crazy, right? That's, you never done that before. That's oh, wow. because if you think about painters, of course, it's called portrait because usually sure. there's one person in the frame. And so yeah. the Renaissance paint, you know, all the beautiful portraits, but that's one person we use horizontal because storytelling you know, you might be interacting with two people in depth and everything. So to figure out how to frame a vertical, skinny vertical format where you had more than one character, it's a really kind wow. of a good brain exercise, you know? Oh, my goodness. Absolutely. Yeah. And and it was only I mean, when Quibi came out, right, it was it, 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 you could only watch it on phone or iPads, right, or right, right. laptops yeah. or something. Right. It was at the phones but now you'll have it on your Roku yeah, channel totally so you can so, watch on tv yeah so that's gonna be fun yeah i, I yeah, like it for sure of course, we shot it in a very cinematic way so that it it will look fantastic you know on the television so of course yeah. and there were so many wonderful shows and all these different things um uh, you know it's curious how that didn't work out to be honest with you to be honest you know it was so like it was everywhere that this was coming out. I was excited. I thought most people would be excited about them. I don't know if that's done with yet. I think it's still, I think that format could still come back around in a different way or also, something. Right? If you think about it though, it came out right in like month the two. The pandemic. Yeah. So totally. people yeah. were able to sit at home and watch things on their TV. They didn't That's have a to. great point. Zooming that's a great point. But we weren't on the subway anymore, you know? Or yeah in an uber we were just at home so. yeah that's a great point i didn't even think of that you're right that totally that's it i mean wow the whole point was to be able to watch it wherever you are and sure now yeah. you look nowhere <laughs> my gosh yeah, yeah we're coming up on a year absolutely um uh, yeah that's insane yeah you're right uh yeah because that's what a couple stops okay you watch a couple things you're off or whatever you're walking uh yeah yeah you're oh waiting, man! You're waiting in line at a restaurant or in a club. Sure. You watch it, and and that there are a lot of those in between moments, you know. Sure. But once you're at home, and then since you couldn't project it onto the TV at the very beginning, I think you could later on, like six months later. But it so it was hard. Like, okay, I'm sitting at home. I got this big TV. Why do I want to watch that? You know. 
Totally. That's- you're not going to, right? You're just like, you're not going to do that. Uh, yeah, 100%. Uh, wow. Well, I hope, um, I'm glad that these shows are going to get back out so that people can see them. Yeah, you know, um, that- a lot of really cool people made shows. A lot oh, of yeah. actors and filmmakers. And yeah, I'm dying to see all the ones I didn't see too. You know, That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, absolutely. You know, let's talk about your your first film. You mentioned a little bit, uh, 13. Um, I remember when that movie came out. Um, yeah, it was a, f- a phenomenal film. And obviously that, you know, got your your start. Um, ha- had you made some other stuff before that that sort of led you to that or or how did that work? I was um, so I was at UT. I was an architecture student, loved architecture, you know, awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love Austin, of course, who does it, you know, and so, (laughs) but then I realized, you know, architecture people are kind of limited. They want uh, the house that you design for them to look like other people's houses for the most part, because resale on you and does it fit into the neighborhood and zoning laws and blah, blah, blah. So in a way it was very limiting creatively, you know, and there, there are a few like really amazing art, obviously Frank, you're definitely, Plenty of people have broken out of the box, but the majority of architecture is a bit more like building codes, normal shit, you know, it takes years to get something done. So I thought, man, I need to do something else. And I went to film school, UCLA, and, and then I didn't have any money. So I was in art animation at UCLA and they said, hey, uh, you're an architect, maybe you could be a production designer. And so that's why I was a production designer. My first movie was Thrashing. Thrashing, yeah. And so I did know how to build stuff and, you know, I knew how to design. And so I love that. So for a job, I would make money, you know, make my job working for other people's movies, designing their sets. And I worked my way up from Thrashing, $5,000 budget up to like Vanilla Sky, Starring Tom Cruise, you know, oh, wow, ten million dollar budget just for me or whatever, you know. Holy so cow! On that, I I did two movies with Richard Linklater, Newton Boys and uh, Suburbia. I did uh, Cameron, uh, well, Cameron Crowe was Vanilla Sky. Yeah. Uh, David O. Russell, I did Three Kings. Got to build Iraq. No Jordan. way! Oh my gosh! I oh. love Three Kings. That's <laughs> oh, what a great movie. Yes, Build all the Iraqi villages right there in Arizona. You know, it was incredible. So it was in Arizona. I was wondering about that. Looks so real. Let me just tell you something. That movie, you feel like you're. That is the most realistic. To pick. you did a you crush. I'm blown away right now. You crushed that because it really feels. I remember when that movie came out. All my friends, everybody, were just like, "Holy shit! This did they film this in Iraq?" Right? I mean, it just feels like yeah. you're there. It's that wow. Well, that was crazy because at that time there were, you know, we could not get any information out of Iraq. You know, it was like really yeah. you know, completely. That was what, 99? I mean. And, and nobody had really been, barely been out there. So I would find Iraqi refugees in Arizona that had a scrapbook and they're standing out in front of their house. And then I, and I would say, uh, Oh, I see a little corner. Oh, is that what the house looked like? Like I was. Oh my gosh. References were just insane. And then I would get the Iraqi refugees to come out to the little village I built on a copper mine. And then I said, I want you guys to do the graffiti against Saddam Hussein. So I'd give him a spray can and I'd say, you know, they started writing on the wall and then I'd walk away. I came back a minute later. They had found rocks and were smashing this shit up. I'm like, yeah, this is a set. I have to shoot this. Calm down. <laughs> that was it. Hey, wow. You know, they just came out. So I tried to make it as real as I could, finding real people from Iraq, you know, that had escaped. Anyway, it was it was really interesting. But so I worked my way up working on yeah. bigger movies, which I've loved. But in between, I would be taking another acting class. In between every job, I'd take a writing class. I'd write a screenplay. I'd make a short film. I would be doing stuff all the time, trying to get to make my own movies. And then finally, uh, uh, yeah, and I asked like Rick, Richard Linklater, Rick, you know, can you help me? And all this stuff. And of course, Rick gets five million people a year saying, I want to direct and help me. 
you know, <laughs> Rick is a creator. He's doing his own thing. So he goes, hey, you want to direct? Well, then direct, Catherine. And I'm like, shit, he's not going to help. You know, he was my buddy. And <laughs> I worked so hard in his movies. I thought he'd help. But that was good advice. You want to direct? Well, then just do it, you know. And so I kept writing screenplays, doing these short films. And finally, I wrote a screenplay with Nikki Reed, who was 13 at the time, that was all about, let's say, poor people. So I could use my own house, my own clothes, my own car. And it didn't take a big budget to do it. And, you know, and I just said, I'm going to make this movie no matter what, you know, and we did end up making wow. it. Wow. But yeah. Unbelievable. So just, just do it. Right. That was, that was what got you to get going was yeah. just hearing that. You have to do it. And then I thought about, okay, Richard Linklater's obviously first movie slacker. Yeah. Supposed to be 9, slacker. Uh, David O. Russell's first movie, uh, spanking the monkey. That was like $80,000. It's like, you know, nobody just handed them piles of money either. So I'm like, okay, I want to do this one way or the other, you know? <laughs> That's awesome. Well, so glad you did because look at all the stuff you've put out, right? Like if you hadn't uh, taken that leap, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow, what an amazing story. That, that's amazing. And when you finished, did you feel like, okay, we, we got something here or were you still scared? Was there, was that a big part of it? Like, you know, now what we made the movie now what? Well, we didn't have time to think about that because we did get it. Well, first of all, I knew the performances were, fucking off the charts. Evan yeah. Rachel Wood. She killed it. 14 year old. You know, she had just turned 14. She was off the hook. Holly Hunter and Nikki Reed, who'd never acted, did it. They all did such a good job. And I knew because I wrote it with a 13 year old girl who was living it. And then she was in it. I knew it had something that we hadn't seen on film before. You know, yeah. I knew that it was had this energy that was like, Shit. And then we submitted it to Sundance and we got in. So from the day that you find you get in, it's just like Death Race 2000. You're trying to finish the thing, get the news, you know, get the picture done. And like that last, you know, seconds here, I'm, I'm Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve. I was in the lab trying to wow. sort out the problems with the film, you know, trying to do the DI. And so like, you're just, you know, you're the proverbial, like racing to Sundance. Here it is, you know, <laughs> and, and then the opening day, you know, was we, we scored a position on opening day at the Eccles theater. That's like a phenomenal position. And so there is like, you know, whatever, 1500 people and then, and, the whole time I'm holding, I'm sitting next to Nikki and I'm holding her hand. And like, we're like white knuckling. Are they going to hate it? Are they going to love it? What's going to oh happen? My God. And then at the end, people started applauding and they really loved it. And we all had to go up on stage and, you know, there was a very positive response, you know, overwhelming response. And I was like, Oh shit, <laughs> <laughs> we did it. The race is over. <laughs> oh, yeah, like just a sense of relief right yeah yeah absolutely that was incredible and then that whole you know week at Sundance you're running around and doing Q&A's and so you're up on the stage talking about it you know five more times or whatever and you know after each screening so you learn a lot about what the audience thinks about it how they felt how it resonated with them or yeah. what they hated you, know, you you really get to learn a lot that week and then you do interviews with the press or whatever so that was just mind-boggling yeah oh my gosh no absolutely that's amazing i mean that's amazing i'm so so grateful for the contributions that led you to write for for audiences uh down the road uh, that's amazing gosh and then from there you do lords of dogtown right and then from there you started a phenomenon catherine that has been i mean let's be real here. you started a phenomenon you didn't probably know you were going to start i read this great vanity fair article uh, about or variety i think i don't want to say i can't remember if it was variety or vanity fair about um yeah just you starting right when you when you directed twilight and how i didn't know the backstory that it wasn't really meant to be you know this 
whatever that they were right this whole big thing uh it was just like an independent film and you were actually having to cut budgets and you know getting everybody cast was kind of difficult so yeah if we could talk a little bit about that i just i found that so fascinating and then what it led to it was like the the you know the whatever in the dam right the little crack in the dam um from there (laughs) well i was at sundance again it goes back to sundance they had me on the jury they invited me to be on the jury 2007 and so i'm there and they have you know you go to dinner with people and i went to a dinner with uh three people that were, uh, you know, forming the new company, a new version of Summit, because Summit had been an international sales company, distribution company, but they wanted to start making their own product. So they said, hey, one of them, Eric Fee, goes, yeah, you know, we like uh, 13 so much, Catherine, and maybe you could, and Dogtown, um, uh, we're starting a new company and we're going to give you like five scripts. And if you like any of them, then maybe we can get one to go. And so after Sundance, I go home and I read the five scripts. And I threw them all in the trash and I, I didn't like any of them. They were terrible. <laughs> and I couldn't relate to any of them. And then the next day I'm like, well, what was that vampire one again? Let me pull it out of the trash and look at it. And then I looked at, okay, it's a book. Okay. The book has a pa- wasn't as well known, of course, as it, but it had a passionate following online. So I read the book and I suddenly saw like a whole different way to do it than the script. So I said, can I come in and have a meeting? And I walked in, I said, first of all, the script you guys have trash. We got to start over <laughs> like the book. Now they hadn't even read the book. Nobody in the room had even read the book. I oh go, my. They were just looking at what it was. It was just a project that came in turnaround. You know, Paramount at one point was going to do it. And then they didn't ever do it. They developed it. And then they said, no, we're not going to make this project. So then the producers took it to every studio around town and nobody wanted to make it. Somehow they had come to this new upstart company. And I, and I said, okay, we got to start over. It's got to be more like the book because the reason I think people like the book it's this crazy, mad, intoxicating, falling madly in love, first love. And, you know, I liked the idea that it would be, I'd never seen vampire. I'd seen vampires like in dark streets in Paris and London, yeah. but I'd never seen them in a forest. And I love the Pacific Northwest. You know, my family lived, had moved to Oregon, some of them. And I love those trees and, you know, everything. I love the moss. So I'm like, I'd love to see vampires in in the moss, that sounds weird, you know, <laughs> like rain in the daytime, trippy. Yeah, you're right. You're I'm, right. I'm like, that's kind of out there. So, you know, I thought maybe, and I'm very environmentally conscious. So I thought maybe this can get people to love the environment, you know, love trees, love nature, blah, blah, blah. So I oh. even Bella, you know, a vegetarian, she's not in the book. She orders a veggie burger. I have the kids go on a school field trip to watch the compost with the worms. You know, I kind of snuck all my like environmental messages in there and I stuff. Like that. But it's true. Like, I think if, if since every studio in town did not think it would make any money and they said, this is a girl's book. The last girl's book was sisterhood in the traveling pants. And that was a very popular book. They told yeah. me, and that made like 29 million at the box office. And that's about the most this book could ever make. Well, uh, cut to <laughs> okay, weekend 69 million. And they said, well, that's, that's all that's ever, it's ever going to make. Everybody saw it opening weekend cut to 400 million worldwide, just for my movie cut to, you know, 2 billion for the, you know, 3 billion for the franchise. So, you know, they, nobody knew what they had, you know, and the fact that it was just kind of under the radar, I got to make it more like an indie movie and make it more personal. I didn't have to cast big Disney stars or something like that. I could get people that people didn't really even know, you know, and, and there's a very fun story of how I found Kristen Stewart. Should I tell you that? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Cause they're both phenomenal actors, right? Just look at them now. Oh, like yeah. you, you, right. You picked, I mean, yeah. So and the, of course they were before that too, but, but the thing that was cool is uh, it goes back to Lords of Dogtown. So I, I had a screening of Lords of Dogtown for Sean Penn. Okay. Cause he was interested in the skating cause he narrated the doc. And so the studio yeah. uh, 
Sony let me go up there and show Sean and his kid, who was a skater, show them the movie. And at the end of the movie, Sean goes, uh, oh, I got it. You know, Heath Ledger was amazing, but who is that kid? Let's call Emil. him. Emil. Emil. Was it Emil Hirsch? Yeah. yeah. So we called Emil on my phone. I go, Emil, I, somebody wants to talk to you. Boom, Sean Penn. And wow. he loved Emil and cast him in Into the Wild, right? And That's then, how we got cast into the wild. Oh, I got into the wild. And so then, and then it's even better. So then I got, they invited me to an early screening of Into the Wild, like a rough cut. I see Kristen Stewart sitting there in the trailer, like trying to, you know, get together, trying to hook up with Emil. And I like, I love that girl. Who is she? I yeah. cast her in Twilight, you know, wow. so, <laughs> you know, it was kind of cool. Wow. That is amazing. Wow. That is so crazy. So that, so that for you, when you saw her in that scene or whatever, or that part of the film, you yeah. thought, yeah, th this is it. This is who I need. She had wow. this longing, this sense of longing for him. And that was just palpable. And I thought that's sure. what I felt when I read the book and that, that this girl, Bella is just like so drawn to this guy. And it's kind of what everybody feels your first crush, you know, you're just sure. like, I cannot live with, I'm going to die. Yeah. <laughs> every that person takes every move they make, you know, so you know, I, it was so like over the top in a way, you know, this like longing. I'm like, I want to see if I can really feel that on screen. You know, if I can yeah. make people feel that in the theater, like, Oh, first love crazy. Wow. And I think it worked because people have seen that movie. Like, uh, yeah, it definitely worked. Uh, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> it probably worked better than you know you, you know maybe you wanted or you thought right i'm sure it's like i mean it was a worldwide i mean still it right worldwide phenomenon i mean it set off a chain of events like i said uh they became big star they were together um you know yeah that's crazy and how, how did you so so robert patterson so what was he like first choice did you know yeah th oh, this yeah. is so that was really hard because if you read the book you know this is this idealized perfect brooding beautiful vampire and like who's that going to be so i started looking at you know actors and a lot of actors came in and they were really cute but they kind of look like the cute guy next door the cute guy in your high school they didn't really look otherworldly you know i see i'm like oh okay. my god to have somebody that's like another level in a way yeah. and then i you know he had done five years before i think he had done the harry potter yeah. uh uh one of the harry potters and he was very good in that and then i saw some photos that had been taken of him and his cheekbones and things i'm like oh he's intriguing so i talked to him in london and he and you know we had a good call he loved Kristen. he'd seen her you know and he knew about Kristen and, you know, he liked 13, uh, but he wanted to do an audition and he, then he hated his audition. So I said, well, listen, uh, he wouldn't even send it to me. So I said, okay, I'm bringing my top four or five guys over to my house. Cause I like to do casting in a more casual manner over to my house in Venice on this day, like two weeks from now. And Kristen's going to like do like four scenes with each guy and if you can pay your own way and fly over here, you know, you're going to be put in the mix. And so he, he flew himself over and he slept on his agent's couch, you know, and he showed up and his hair had been dyed black for some play and he had weird bangs and is a little pudgy from being at the bar at pub too much. And <laughs> pretty sure that he had that, you know, something amazing. And, and, you know, so after like two hours, we did a bunch of different scenes and played around and tried different things. And Kristen was like, okay, it's gotta be him. You know? wow. <laughs> and, and so I remember I edited the footage and then I showed it to the studio and they're like, Catherine, does this guy look good? I mean, is he going to be? <laughs> and they said, you know, he came over to see us and he's all, you know, dirty shirt. I go, no, I'm doing a makeover on him. I already told him he's going to start working out at a gym. We're going to do his eyebrows. We're going to do this to the teeth. We're changing his hair. 
I'm going to make them look good. I promise you. And somehow they trusted me. You know, we didn't even <laughs> do a proper screen tip. You know, I think now if, if it was a big, if they thought it was going to make that kind of money, we would have had screen, t- you know, there would have been a committee of 50 people weighing in on it. No, nope. wow. they went for it, you know? Wow. Wow. Well, so much better, right? You had, like you said, you got to make it like an independent film and that, that's what made it special. Um, I'm sure that's something that uh, directors and act, right, you always have to deal with uh, studios yeah. impeding yeah. on the creative aspect of things, I'm sure. And it, and it was true. I mean, of course, they cared about it. And, you know, they were invested in the film, but they weren't overseeing like every single second and double thinking everything. They yeah. were very supportive. And, you know, the fact that I had pretty much very unknown actors under the radar. I thought that was better for the movie because then you could really believe that that's Bella and Edward. Sure. You know, sure. That's, Absolutely. My Bella, that's my Edward. You didn't have to remember 33 things that each actor had done before. You could yeah. just fall into it, you know? Yeah. Good point. Yeah. That's a great point. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Wow. That is so amazing. Um, gosh. And so when you're on set, uh, you know, making this movie, were you thinking, um, I mean, obviously you weren't thinking this was going to be what it was, right. But you knew you had something special, uh, you you know, was your, was your thought, I just want to be true to the book. Was that really what you wanted to do with the film? True to the spirit of the book. Okay. but I took the book and see, I made it more cinematic than the book. So I made, I basically like there's this treetop sequence in Twilight where you kind of fly through the trees. That's not yeah. in the book, but that was the spirit of the book. Or like sure. she revealed to when she said, How old are how old are you? 17. That's a pivotal scene in the book. But in the book, it's just in the car. And I'm like, uh, no, not the car two people, seat belts. I'm putting it out in the forest, use a techno crane, you know, move around, make it really cool. So I tried to expand the book, make it more cinematic. Yeah. Love that. That's awesome. Wow. That's amazing. I, that's why, that's why they picked you, you know? <laughs> well, so. I, I was very in the moment and not worrying, not trying to freak out about, you know, what's the end result. Let's just make the best most passionate, you know, beautiful, fun movie we could, you know, in the moment. So that was pretty fun. It was Uh, fun. Yeah. yeah. No, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, And and you have a new project um, coming out that I saw. I don't want to forget that before we go. Um, It's called Heathen, right? Is that right? Oh, Um, that's actually, that's in development. Or development. I have probably... I hate to say like 10 different projects in development right now. (laughs) It's kind of like you have your little babies that you're like watering them and giving them fertilizer and putting them out in the sun and hope the little plant will grow. (laughs) And so I've got, you know, really beautiful um, projects. And Joey King is attached to that one. I have something with Kate Beckinsale, Sam Elliott, Annie Hathaway, uh, Tony, you know, so each thing, you know, we're trying to, you know, uh, obviously we got the COVID issues, you know, some, some movies are being postponed a little bit because we don't want to spend such a large chunk of the budget. You know, there's a, like a big piece of the budget you have to spend on COVID officers and, you know, uh, I see what it actually wastes a lot of money that could go up on the screen or sure. if you have a scene with a lot of X, if it's a movie that has a lot of extras, that's not very COVID friendly, you know, sure. so trying to figure out which one can go and, you know, when is the actors ready and when is the script yeah. picked in the budget, you know, you're just waiting for lightning to strike right now. I was on this beautiful movie in New Orleans with Samuel Jackson, Naomi Watts, Pete Davidson, and three weeks before shooting, we were doing all the planning and prepping and costumes and choreography and stunts. And then of course COVID hit and we had to, shut down oh so i hope that heathen is a really cool viking badass comic book we hope that one can go and yes that's why i found it intriguing i I was like oh that just struck my eye when i was reading about it it's so fun it is the most fun uh yeah it's just a very empowering but hilarious story so we're actually have a, a zoom about that later today 
uh, with oh. the writer because we're writing a little, you know, making it a little bit more manageable, the budget, a little more COVID friendly, a little more manageable because sure. it was like huge at first. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's probably the best way to start, right? Think big and then sort of bring it back. Uh, seems I like more character based and everything, but that is yeah. a very fun, it's a fun comic too. Yeah. Yeah, right on. Is the movie that you were doing with Naomi Watts, you said Sam Jackson and Pete Davidson? Yes. Interesting. Oh is it still going to happen? Is that still going to happen? Oh, we don't know because, um, you know, that was pre-sold in the old model of foreign sales where you, you know, you get the distrib distributor in France, Germany, everybody contributes money. And then you say, great, you know, we're going to have worldwide distribution. Now that model is like, very unstable now because what is the capacity in theaters now you can only have half capacity in theaters or you know the, yeah. the distributors can't contribute as much as they used to be able to because of the instability so and some of them are even on the brink of bankruptcy you know theater chains all over the world so it's very unstable i hope it comes back together because it's the most fun movie yeah it's what, can you say what it's called or um, well, I, we might even be changing the name, so I can't really say, but it's about sure. a, a very cool, like two time periods, a heist that happened in new Orleans and oh it's my God. really fun, you know, it's oh. fun. Oh, please. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm praying to the, to the, to the film gods and to the every God at this point to, to let, let oh yes. What was it? I mean, uh, you know, I don't want to take up too much time here, but Catherine, what was it like working with Pete? I, God, I love Sam Jackson, but I'm curious about Pete Davidson. He's on such a like hot streak uh, right now. Uh, right. You know, we didn't get to start shooting because we, we were three weeks from shooting. So, so mostly it was, I had done zooms with him and sure. Stuff. And, you know, and he and the character, he had a lot of things in the character that he could relate to, you know, loss of his father, different things. Yeah. And and but it had a lot of fun parts and it had action. And, you know, in my mind and he's so fun, he's so creative that it would have just been he would have just really like popped in a major sure. way in this part. It was such a fun movie. So I'm just hoping we can you know oh, get it. God. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that he was interested in a role like that. And you as well that put him in a role like that. Um, you know, I, I think his, yeah, he's got a long road ahead of the, of him. I'm, I'm, I'm happy for him and Sam Jackson, Naomi Watts. Uh, they're just like juggernauts. Uh, I pretty much love everything they both have done. I think of 23 grams every time I think of Naomi Watts. I love that movie so much. It's so good. And then in new Orleans, you know, new Orleans, is such a great character. And, you know, so oh, I just, yeah. I think about this like one year ago, I was at Mardi Gras. Yep. New Orleans. It was all fun. And we were prepping and we were out there on the streets and, you know, and then, and so then one day on, on Friday, I'm talking to Samuel Jackson on a Skype before zoom. And, you know, he's, we're talking about his wardrobe. He's going to go into the costume shop two days later, you know, and get his wardrobe on. That's on a Friday. And then on Monday, we find out all the costume shop, Western costume is shut. Everything is shut. You know, wow. COVID has and like, wait a minute. And we thought, well, we can still do the movie because a lot of our movies outside. And then we went with the New Orleans. We were supposed to go with somebody from the city of New Orleans to look at this exterior location. Wait a minute. They had to be preparing for emergency stuff. So suddenly we realized we can't keep making this movie. The world is shut down. But I left like two boxes there in New Orleans of my stuff because we thought it was only going to be two weeks. Remember yeah. that? Yeah, two weeks. Exactly. Two yeah. weeks. Got 14 days. We're coming back in two weeks. So I still got boxes. Of stuff. Wow. Oh, my goodness. You never thought it would be a year, right? Or, or Every however. Day. Yeah heartbreak you know like yeah. all beautiful things and you know of course i even feel more sorry for people that graduate and had to do virtual graduations uh, yes they can't get jobs or people that are homeless i mean it's just you know crazy insane yeah absolutely i mean 100 percent. there's hope so yes know, absolutely everything yes big hope 100 uh, percent. there's definitely a lot of hope uh you know you're a texan i'm a texan that's what we're about, right? At the end of the day, uh, I don't think that part of Texas ever leaves you. Um, you know, we get, we'll get through this. Look, we just got through the worst winter storm we ever thought we would see. My heart, we'll be, I, 
didn't even mention that my heart goes out to everybody. I mean, I'm just uh, hoping that the grid gets sorted out and <laughs> all the water and <laughs> everything. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I tell everybody, um, if you know a Texan, please hit them up, make sure they're okay. And if they're not, they know somebody that's not, I promise you. Uh, it's pretty, cra- it was definitely the craziest week I've ever had in Texas in my whole life, but by far, by uh-huh. far, it was, it was like, it felt like, it felt like um, I was telling people, it felt like Hurricane Harvey happened to the whole state. That's what it felt like. It felt because there was nobody you could call who wasn't going through it as well. Right. There was no it was nothing. It, it was so crazy. It was absolutely insane. And everybody you call might even have it worse than you or. Yeah, exactly. It was like uh, exactly that. That's exactly it. And even if you did have power or whatever, and I thankfully did. And I had people come over my house, you know, oh. I brought them. Brought, yeah, they were sleeping in their car. I was like, oh, my gosh, we're, we're you know, you're, you're coming out. They had a child. They have a dog. Right. It was like, oh, no, no, no. This is this is horrifying. This is just, you know, food, uh, you name it. Honestly, we're still kind of dealing with it because we are. I mean, for a few weeks, we're still going to be dealing with it. You know, the aftermath of the stuff. So, yeah, again, if you if you know anybody, if you're listening, right, if you know a Texan, uh, reach out, uh, please, uh, and make sure that they're OK. But yeah. Anyway, hopeful, though. Again, we're Texans. We're strong. We help each other. We're going to get through. It's no problem. We got this. <laughs> well listen Catherine I can't tell you how amazing this has been is there anything I, I didn't uh, mention that you wanted to mention um, I don't want to leave anything out well you know of course I love Texas I got a lot of cousins relatives nieces everybody there so shout out to everybody and Mac Allen is where I'm from you know of course Mac gone through all kinds of crazy stuff at the border and everything but um, yeah, any chance I can, I'd love to come back there. I, I, I try to go and, well, before COVID was, you know, helped at Richard Linklater's, you know, projects for up and coming filmmakers and, you know, we'll do stuff for Austin Film Society. So, lo- and UT, everything. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, listen, Catherine, if you ever need a podcaster for a film, okay, this is oh, it. I'm right here. Okay. Yeah. I'm available. You're so good. You're so fun, too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, this is my job. How could I not have fun? Like, I get to talk to I get to talk to amazing people all the time. It's, I love my job. That's so cool. Yeah, yes. great. Yeah. Smart job. I like it. Okay, well, <laughs> sending love to you guys. and uh, Thank you so much, bye. Catherine. Hook them horns. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And please be safe out there uh, for you, your staff, everybody. And, and hopefully all these projects, uh, you know, get off the ground. I know you'll do great. And, uh, you know, just thank you for everything. This was just so amazing. I, I really do appreciate the time today, Catherine. Cool. Thanks. Awesome. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time.